Today we've got a great malicious compliance story against an apartment complex that is desperate to find people for parking improperly. We'll get to that story in a bit, but first, salaried exempt employees have to punch a time card now? Okay, it would sure be a shame if someone notified the labor board about your illegal PTO practices though. A few years ago, I was employed by a relatively small but publicly traded company. I virtually guarantee you wouldn't recognize the name if you weren't in their specific little corner of industry. Well, this place went public and decided to use some of the money to purchase an even smaller company, and suddenly we were in the Department of Defense contracting business. As you may or may not know, the US Department of Defense places restrictions on private sector contractors about how much profit they're allowed to make among other cost control mechanisms. One such mechanism is that anyone working on Department of Defense contracts has to charge their time to specific project codes so that they can compare your actual costs to the costs you estimated when you were awarded the contract. Well, our genius company decided that instead of only having the personnel working on these projects, which was no more than 50 people out of over a thousand, that they would make every single salary person sign a time card every week. For 95% plus of us, we charged 100% of our labor to the commercial side of the business, which was one project code, non-defense overhead or something like that. Most people just charged 8 hours per day regardless of how many hours they actually worked because no one tracks their time down to the minute. Shortly after this happened, new state legislation went into effect requiring that all employers provide one hour of sick leave per 40 hours worked. Nobody paid much attention to it, but I did because I was in a fairly specialized engineering role, with only two of us at the whole company, and I trained the other guy who also happened to live overseas to support another site. This is important later. I started charging my actual hours. I noticed that despite how many hours I charged, the amount of PTO I was accruing stayed the same. This happened three or four paychecks in a row, and then I approached HR. They looked at me like I had two heads when I informed them that they were not adjusting my PTO accruals based on hours worked. But your salary, you're paid for 40 hours regardless of how many hours you work, they told me. I explained how that didn't really apply to the situation due to the new legislation. They again looked at me like I was completely crazy. They said they'd get back to me with an answer in a week or two. Fast forward two months, I'm still diligently filling out my time cards like a good little drone, and I've spoken with several of my work buddies who start doing the same. The thing about this particular group of folks was that we all traveled internationally, oftentimes last minute, on a regular basis for work. Well, wouldn't you know it, it turns out that travel time, per our state labor laws, is considered working time. 16 hours worth of flights to Germany, all working time. I believe the language is place of rest to place of rest. And while you're there, you're not exactly relaxing. It's long days handling customer concerns multiple days in a row. A perfect storm of circumstances happened that fall where we were all traveling around the same time and we all booked 120 plus hour weeks of work. We all eagerly awaited our pay stubs to see all that extra PTO accrued and… nope. We approached HR again. They told us they would escalate the issue to their attorney. We went back to work. Well, not surprisingly, things started going downhill for all of us. We started witching about things a bit and we all end up quietly looking for jobs. Within a 5 week period, all of us put in our notices and I lost my patience. I wrote an email to HR detailing our contacts with them and informed them that I would be escalating to the labor board without a full accounting of all back owed PTO that would need to be paid. I got a panicked phone call within about 5 minutes. HR drone said, why are you even recording your hours that way, your salary? I say because we have to fill out time cards. They say, why don't you just put 8 hours per day like everyone else? I said I'm sorry, but it sounds like you're asking me to falsify my time card. When I sign it, the time card specifically asks me whether I've reported my time accurately under threat of prosecution. HR Drone says, no, I'm just… why haven't you brought up this issue previously? I said I have, twice, with you. I detailed those encounters in the email I just sent. I'm sure the company's attorney has informed you of your requirements by now. They say they haven't gotten back to me. Me, grin, now wide across my face says, well, funny enough, I went ahead and emailed our general counsel. 
It turns out my email was the first they've heard the concern. I've put in my notice. I expect to be paid in full for all back owed PTO, or I'll be filing a report with L and I, who take accusations of wage theft fairly seriously. I believe they give you a week to remit payment or pay up to triple what's owed. HR drone goes silent. I say please contact me via email only when you have decided on a path forward. Click. It turns out that not only did I get paid the full PTO I thought I was owed, there was a bit extra on there as well. And one of my buddies went ahead and reported the company to the labor board anyway, which apparently caused quite the stir. Last I heard, the HR department, with the exception of a couple of recruiters, got completely turned over, all the way up to the VP. It might not be the most uh, legal way of going about this, but they definitely should have just uh, not required you to report the time and just accept it if your salary you get paid the 40 hours. But hey, if they're going to bother you about filling out that time card, you might as well make sure you get everything you're actually owed. Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you enjoy awesome stories of malicious compliance, why not hit that subscribe button down below? That said, our next story is, the vehicle won't flip? Whatever you say, boss. So this story is from my IT teacher, we'll call him Joe. Before he was an IT teacher, he served a few years in the Marine Corps, I don't know how many in total. He tells us a lot of stories about his times in the Marines. Some of them are really fun, and others are pretty somber. He told us about his PTSD. It's entertaining nonetheless. Anyways, one of the stories he told us today I knew was perfect material for this sub. I did ask him permission to post it. So when he was in the Marines, he was a sergeant. However, at the time of this, a new person joined the Marines and was about 17 or 18, much younger than him. Joe was probably like mid-twenties at the time. The new guy, we'll call him Noob, was higher ranked than Joe, but still younger and a bit cocky. So Joe and the rest of his platoon were going over Mount Fuji on an amphibious vehicle, basically a big military van. So considering it's a massive mountain, they came to a part of the mountain that had a really steep tilt to it. Now keep in mind there's two types of radio communication, intercom and radio. Intercom means what's being said will be told to everyone who has a radio, but radio will only go between two people. So Joe was driving the vehicle and they got to the steep part. Noob decided that he thought the vehicle could survive it and make it over just fine. Joe knew that it most definitely wouldn't. He was in the Marines for much longer than Noob. Noob over the intercom argued with Joe. He was telling him to go forward and that the vehicle would make it, but Joe argued back with him saying it wouldn't. Eventually Noob said, I'm ordering you to drive this vehicle forward now. Now, given that this was a direct order, Joe obviously had no choice but to comply. So over the intercom, Joe told the rest of his platoon to buckle up and hold on tight. He closed the latch above his seat and buckled up too. Noob was confused by this but didn't buckle up or close the latch above him. Joe started to pull forward and once they got onto the steep part, they were going decently good. Noob seemed pretty confident. However, almost immediately, the vehicle started to tip slowly. One of those where you can feel it for a little before it flips. So Joe held on tight, and then they fell. They tumbled around like five times. During their falling, Noob flew out of the hatch, or jumped out, he wasn't sure, but wasn't really hurt. He got a concussion from the door to the hatch, hitting his head as he went out. Joe was fine due to being buckled up, but some of the other passengers weren't buckled, so they flew around. Most of them broke a bone or two and or got a concussion. Once they stopped, Joe got up and left the vehicle. Their gunnery sergeant, we'll call him Red, immediately ran over. Now, Red was your textbook tough guy marine sergeant. He was almost 7 feet tall, extremely built, broad shouldered, everything you'd expect. Joe immediately started explaining that it was an order and that he had to listen. Red said he had heard everything due to the argument being on the comms. Noob ran over a minute or so later and started yelling, What did you teach them? They don't even know how to drive! Basically sicking the blame on Joe. Red, having heard everything, stomped over to Noob and grabbed him by the front of his shirt, yanking him forward and yelling at him. He then pushed Noob forward and socked him right in the face, knocking him out and dropping him. Joe did say to the class that if Noob hadn't said everything on comms, he could have gotten in trouble but most likely he would have straight up said no to going forward, but it was just too perfect. He's a great teacher, everyone loves him. I mean, an order is an order, but imagine staring down something so daunting and dangerous and you know is a horrible, horrible idea, 
and could very well go very wrong for people. I mean, they're very lucky that nobody died. I mean, I know they got an order to go forward, but maybe they should have just not gone regardless, even if they got in trouble. Our next story is, don't want to annul the duplicate fines? Have fun getting all of them canceled. This happened a few years ago, but I never got to share it. I used to rent an apartment in a big complex of around 200 apartments, as well as an outdoor parking space. The rules by the real estate agency who was administering the apartment complex were that you had to display your renter's card in your car when parked. The agency provided you this card when your parking lease would begin. To enforce this rule, a private company would frequently patrol the area and issue fines to any parked vehicle without a card. The police had no jurisdiction there as these were private parking spaces. Technically, these were inconvenience fees because only the police could issue a fine. But for all terms and purposes, they were equivalent to fines, as if you didn't pay within 14 days, they could send them to collections. Some people have their card permanently attached to their windshield to avoid the risk of forgetting to display it. I don't feel comfortable to do so as the card displays my address. Therefore, I just prefer to manually take it out of the glove box and display it when parked. Cue a two-week vacation with my wife, and we both forget to take the card out. We had the car serviced the morning before the trip, so we left in a hurry. You know where this is going now. We return back and find not one, but three fines, each of 60 US dollars equivalent. The other two were duplicates issued on different days. The private company had patrolled the area thrice during our absence. On top of that, the initial fine had expired, so I was most likely expecting a reminder slapped with a reminder fee or around $20. Fine, I forgot to display the card, I'll pay the fine. But not all three of them. Had I not been on vacations, I'd have just placed the card in the car after the first fine. I wrote a polite letter to the company, explaining the situation and providing the flight tickets to prove our absence. I assume the responsibility of paying the initial fine, but before I do, I kindly request to have the duplicate ones annulled. The security company wouldn't budge. You know the rules of the real estate agency. Have the card on display or else pay the fine. You have to pay all three of them. Well, since these were the rules, I decided to forward the entire situation to the real estate agency, asking to have the duplicates annulled. An administrative assistant emails me the next day saying, Hi, we talked today with the security company. We've annulled all fines, including the initial one. You can safely toss them away. However, please make sure to clearly display your card next time to avoid such issues. A few days later, I saw a notice in another building that read, If you've forgotten your card and received a fine, please call the real estate agency to resolve this. This notice probably predated my incident, but it then became clear that the security company was employing predatory tactics to collect fees that were marginally legal. Corporate greed deprived them of $60 that day. They could have just agreed to annul the duplicate fines, but instead opted to collect $180. You just know when you're calling up some kind of crappy security company like this and you say, hey, I'm an honest person that made an honest mistake, they're gonna crack down on you like you just kicked a puppy. Not just kicked a puppy, you just full on football punted that thing. You know the rules, rules are rules, you pay up, you criminal. This next story is a little lighthearted malicious compliance. I was about 14 or 15 and I was in the living room, laying on the carpet watching television with my brother, sister, and my father. My mom worked nights, so we spent most evenings with my dad. He liked order. He wasn't real strict or mean, he never really spanked us or anything like that. It was more along the lines of the idea of a spanking. The thought of getting the swat across the bottom was enough. I had never really pushed his buttons. I was a pretty good kid, until the divorce, but that's another story but I considered myself too old for that nonsense anymore. This was my first try at a little pushback. So, the sun's going down, dinner's over with, dishes are done, and we're all stretched out among the various pieces of furniture, and as I said, I was on the floor with a big pillow, and we were watching whatever was on the tube that night. My dad liked to have the room dimmed while watching TV when it was dark out and the sunset was approaching. He said, OP, flip off the light. I didn't think. It wasn't premeditated. I didn't even know I had this level of smart buttery in me, but I did as I was told. 
I rolled over, extending my arm up towards the light fixture, and as serious as I could, I flipped off the light. I made sure to hold the pose as I presented my dad with my first ever full-blown middle finger in his presence. He paused and looked at me. His eyes went just a little wider as he realized I was doing just as he had asked. He started to laugh, and I'm not ashamed to admit that I was relieved. While he was still chuckling, I jumped up and ran over to the light switch and flipped the light switch off. I know it's not a big deal, but it still makes me smile. Not gonna lie, as a kid, I was the kind of person I did not swear in front of my parents. Honestly, I still don't. I, it just seems like such a weird thing to me for some reason. So doing something like this would be like a huge like, oh crap, how they're gonna react moment. Although there definitely was a time where I was just rambling one time in the car, let the F word slip out accidentally. My response was to just keep on talking and just ramble for as long as I could before there's just no comfortable space for them to even mention that I said the F word. It worked out, they didn't mention it. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another crazy malicious compliance story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.